So I want to talk about the learning objective checkpoint before we get into some new content. Uh, just a few things I want to mention. First, if you, um, if you received an extension on the right portion of it, I sent you an email. Anyone who didn't complete the right portion should have gotten an email from me. Uh, so if you didn't get an email, that either means you just finished the right portion or uh, there's some issue and you should contact me, email me and uh, I'll let you know what's going on. Uh, but all of you should know where you are with the right portion. With the explain and read, the grades are posted on the website. They were posted uh, a few hours after lecture on Friday. I, I don't remember the exact time we, that we got them pushed. Um, but the grades are up there. You either have a one or a zero for each one of them. If you have a zero that mean, for either of them or both, that means you've got to go to lab this week and you can take your second chance uh, interview or quiz. It's not that big of a deal if you don't get the first one. That's why there's two baked into the schedule already. And then the third and fourth, we've talked about that to death. I don't want to talk about that again. Um, but uh, go to lab, do your makeup, study for it, prepare for it, and uh, knock that out. What I want to remind everybody is if you click on your score, especially if you have a zero, click on the score, and it'll give you some feedback. And it'll give you, it'll let you know what you need to be studying for the exam. So if you did really well on certain portions, but there was just one aspect that you just, uh, that you dropped the ball on on the quiz or interview, your feedback's gonna say something like that. It's gonna say like, uh, study variable scoping. For the quiz, that was the number one thing why students failed the quiz. Uh, variable scoping, as a group, y'all, that one didn't really sink in that great. Uh, I don't wanna say y'all, because if it's everybody, uh, then maybe I gotta explain it better. Uh, but variable scoping, make sure you're reviewing those lectures and understand if there's a variable inside a block of code and outside of a block of code with the same name, uh, how that's going to be resolved and, uh, and exactly what's going on on the stack when that happens. That that variable will be on the stack multiple times with the same name in different blocks and then which variable is going to be used when that variable is used. Uh, so hopefully everybody's on the same page with that. You know what you're doing for lab this week. If you pass both the interview and quiz, you don't have to go to lab this week. So if you got it in one shot, take a week off of lab. I think that's everything. Is there anything important I'm missing with that? What's up, Dragos? Don't think I'm forgetting anything. On Wednesday, I have to remember to remind you about review session again. Uh, on Wednesdays, right after class, there is review session led by TAs on Twitch, right after Wednesday's lectures every week. Uh, I keep forgetting to advertise it. I remembered last Friday and Monday. My big test is this Wednesday. I have to remember Wednesday in two days to remind you. Uh, so everybody can fresh in your memory, go right after Wednesday's lecture, um, pop into the Twitch. Um, and uh, Bryn, come on. <laughs> you know how distracting that is, right? Uh, so let's get into some content. Are there any questions about anything? Let's get into some content. So first, I want to play this game a little bit. We're going to talk about this game as today's example and explain how this works and talk about the state pattern. Uh, so let's explore this a little bit. So I already lost my other player. I'm going to be bold and restart it. OK, so we have two players here. And the goal is to jump up on these platforms faster than the other player. So I can control both players right now. And as soon as the red player goes off of the screen, they're done. Uh, what we really want to focus on with this game, so the goal is just to jump higher than the other player. What we really want to focus on this game is the jump mechanic. So there's a lot of, of features in this jump. For example, let me get up here first. If I just jump, I get a regular jump, and I can jump that high. The height of the jump is going to de depend on how long I hold the jump button down. If you ever played a platformer game, a lot of these are features that, uh, that you're used to, that, but that you may or may not have thought about actively. Uh, if I hold down the button longer, I'll jump higher. This is a full jump. This is just tapping the button. And I can do like a mid jump, back to full jumps. Uh, I also jump higher if I'm running. If I run and jump, I jump quite a bit higher. Or I could do a run and short jump if I just tap the button. If I turn around midair, I'm going to have slower velocity when I turn around. 
think that one mostly games don't do that anymore. They let you turn around and, and keep your full momentum. If I walk off a platform, I'm going to fall off it. I can double jump, which we'll talk about later, uh, pretty late in the lecture. And I know I'm missing a few. Maybe I'm not. Uh, oh, I can jump up through platforms. But when I fall down, I land on the platform. So quite a bit of little features, quite a bit of features in this little game. Uh, the, obviously, I didn't invest in the graphics here. Uh, but we got a bit going on with the mechanics. And that's what we want to talk about today, how to get all these mechanics. So let's jump over to some slides. I think I already have them open. Oops. And talk about the state pattern and how we're going to build all those mechanics, all those jumping mechanics, using the state pattern. So lecture task six, this is where the state pattern is really going to come into play. This is where I'm really asking you to take what we learned about the state pattern, what we talked about last time with the Hulk example, what we're going to talk about this time with the jumper example, and apply it to your project. This is where we're going to build the entire checkout experience. The user's going to walk up to the machine, punch in a bunch of numbers, scan a bunch of items, go hit checkout, get to the checkout line uh, process where they're going to get the, their subtotal tax and total, and then click cash or credit to simulate paying for those items, and then resetting for the next new user. We have a few different states there that you can think of, one while the user is scanning items, one while the user is checking out, and then another where a new customer is coming in, going back to some uh, scanning state. There are a few states. I don't want to, I'll give away the, the obvious ones there, uh, but the rest of them are up to you to think about how, how all these states are going to work. Uh, and I think that's all I want to talk about the lecture test. Let's just talk about how to do this. So today, we're going to talk about this, and I want to go through my process of how I design using the state pattern. So this is the problem that we're faced with. How do we, do we build the mechanics for this using the state pattern? And then I'll go through, OK, I want to look at this. I want to look at what the API is going to be. I want to look at what states I'm going to have. And I'm going to look at what state transitions I'm going to have. Draw out my state diagram, and then start implementing things. There won't be a lot of code in the slides. The slides are very conceptual. And then if we do have time, I'll jump into IntelliJ and show you a bunch of code. Uh, we should have a bit of time to get into that, but maybe not the whole thing. So this is our game that I just demoed. For this, we only have three buttons that we can hit. I was only hitting left, right, and jump. For each player, these are just slightly different. A, D, W, and left, right, up uh, for each of the players. So with one keyboard, I can control both players. And we want to do all this using states. All right. So here's my spec sheet. These are the features that I want into this game. I'll kind of tediously go through each one of these just to make sure that we know what they all are. I went through them in the demo, but let's make sure we know what all the features are that we want. So whenever a player hits either left or right, they should move in that direction. Whenever they hit jump, they should jump. Pretty straightforward with the first two. Uh, that's just basic functionality uh, that we would expect. If I hit left, I want to go left. If I hit jump, I want to jump. Uh, and we could build that functionality fairly straightforward. Assuming, um, obviously, we didn't talk about the GUI stuff yet. We have a lecture on that coming up. Um, but coding-wise, press left, go left, press right, go right. Uh, the next one gets a little trickier, that jump higher if we're walking versus standing. So if we're in, if we're walking, I want that player to be able to jump higher than if they were just standing still. And how long they hold down the jump button. These should both determine their jump height. If they turn around mid-air, they should slow down. They should have slower velocity. Jump through platforms while jumping up, land on them when they're falling down. Fall off a ledge if you walk off the edge of a ledge. And finally, if you hit the bottom of the screen, if the other player is beating you and jumped up high enough that you're on the bottom of the screen, you're gone, you're done, that's game over for you. So these are all the features that we want. Now, we could do this without using the state pattern at all, of course. Uh, I would be willing to bet, I would bet a, a good sum of money that if you were to write that, like if I had that as a homework assignment, just build this without, uh, do whatever you want, and most of you won't use states. I'm willing to bet that 
a, most of the code that I get, the, most of the code that you submit will be very gross, I guess, for lack of a better term. It'll be very disorganized. It'll be like one big function or method with a lot of code in it, probably hundreds of lines long with a, a single function or method. Uh, maybe one class, you know, just, just the natural things that, uh, the natural way that you would code based on the way that you've coded in 115 and probably so far in this class too. Um, you could get it to work with some pain, um, but you'd be able to get it to work with one big mess of code. But it would be very hard to modify that. It'd be very hard to test it, first of all. Uh, it'd be very hard to modify it to add new features and it'd be very hard for anyone else, including yourself in the future, to read that code to be able to maintain it. You got a question? There are walls on the left and right. Yeah, I got, so if I go to the, the edge, I got a little wall there. It's hard to tell, it's only a few pixels. But I got a wall stopping me. So we want to implement all this behavior using the state pattern. Uh, it is just because we want to practice with the state pattern. Uh, so well, I want to go through these three steps. These are the three steps that I like to take when I'm approaching a problem like this where I want to apply the state pattern. And this is what you should do for lecture task six at the very least. You should be thinking about this with five, but you no know, spoilers, you can actually do lecture task five without states. I highly recommend thinking in terms of states when doing lecture task five, or else you're gonna have to rewrite all that code when you get to six. So just a heads up on that. Uh, if you write all of that functionality in the self-checkout machine class, uh, you're gonna have to rip it all out of there to uh, implement state pattern for lecture task six, just a heads up. Uh, and you're not doing lecture task six without states. Without states or conditionals, it is technically possible, but at that point, you don't need any help on the homework anyway if you're capable of finding a, a third option there. So with the state pattern, when I'm approaching a problem, I say, I want to apply the state pattern. It seems like a good fit for the state pattern. I'm going to write the API. This is any method that changes functionality based on the state. Anything that I'm going to defer to the state. So in my class, I'm going to say, OK, for this functionality, it can change. I can have different behaviors with this. I'm going to defer to my state and just say, the state is responsible for this. Any method where I can say that is part of the API. And that's going to be defined in the state abstract class. So that's the first thing I want to do. What, what's the API? For your homework, this is fairly straightforward uh, because it's all the buttons that are on the GUI. The buttons one through, uh, one through nine and zero, cash, credit, checkout, uh, loyalty card, clear, and enter. Hey, I got them all. Uh, that's your API. There's just the ways that the user can interact, and those buttons will do different things based on the state of the checkout machine. Uh, for this one, it's gonna be fairly straightforward too, left, right, and jump. Uh, for the most part, we'll talk about that in a second though. Uh, when there's user inputs, the API is usually the user inputs. Next, getting trickier, deciding the states. What are the different states that the program can be in, or that an object can be, on, be in that has the state pattern applied to it? These are any conditions that the environment in the program can be in where any method in the API is going to have different behavior. So the way I like to do this, when I, especially when there's a GUI and a bunch of buttons, is think, thinking through when it first starts, so when your self-checkout machine very first starts up, you start your program, what should every button do? Define that as one state, that's your initial state, and then for each button that you press, does that change the behavior of any other button? If it does, you've just hit a state transition. So you have, every time that happens, you have at least a second state. And then keep going through that. Okay, if I hit this button, does any other button, including that one that I pressed, change its behavior? If it does, you, had a, you just hit a state transition, you have another state. And keep doing that until you get a state that circles back around where you have, um, okay, oh, I changed this state, now the API should have this behavior, but that's exactly identical to this behavior, set of behavior that I had over here. Well, now you finally are starting to close the loop. 
you have a state transition to a state that you've already written, and then, uh, and then you can start uh, wrapping up your design. So decide which states should exist. I kind of overlap that with the next one. Decide which states should exist. What are the states that this thing can be in? I'm scanning, I'm uh, checking out, I'm paying. I'm first turning on the machine. Uh, the loyalty card was scanned, things like that. Um, and then finally determining the transitions between them. So I have all these states. How can I transition from one state to another? How do I move between these states? And once you have that, which I strongly, strongly encourage, draw the state diagram. It really helps when designing this. As you're going through this process, draw out the state diagram, draw each one of your states with the state transitions between them until you have your full state diagram. Do that before you write a line of code, aside from your testing, write your test first. Before you have a line of actual code and implementation, have that diagram, and then just implement that diagram in your code. It'll save you a ton of time. If you dive right into the code with a state pattern, I'm warning you right now, you're gonna waste a lot of your time. This is, this is something, I said this last time, I, I'll say it today, I'll probably say it again. Uh, with the state pattern, the challenge is more for designing your code. How are you going to design your states, your state transitions, uh, your API, your abstract class? How are you going to design all that is the bulk of the work for this homework. And then when you go to actually write the code, the code shouldn't be that hard to write. Uh, in my, like, no, not saying that. I, I said that last semester and it, it caused all kinds of trouble. Um, I won't put a number on it, but in my solution, each one of my methods is very short. I used to give a line, uh, a number of lines, and then everybody aims for exactly that. It causes a lot of trouble. Um, each one of my methods is very short. Every method should be very easy to write after you have your program designed. So once you design all your structure for LT6, implementing it should be easy. You should almost get bored of typing. Uh, your typing speed will almost slow you down a little bit. That might be the bottleneck in one of those cases. If you have a rock solid design before you go into the code. If you go into the code without a good design, you're probably gonna be re rewriting that code at least one time uh, because it won't work, it won't do what you expect, and then you have to go back and rewrite everything and restructure. Uh, so go through this process before you write any implementation code. Strongly, strongly recommend it. If you come to office hours, I'm probably gonna ask for your state diagram, or at least to explain your states. All right, so let's pick this apart one at a time. API, look through the spec sheet and figure out, okay, what's the behavior that can change based on the state of the machine? What does different things based on the state of the machine? Uh, for this one, it's pretty easy because we have user inputs. It's gonna be the user inputs. So I have a variety of things, like pressed mostly, but I have this one held which is a little problematic. Uh, we can solve this by saying, okay, my API isn't just pressing left, pressing right, and pressing jump. It's going to be when it's pressed down and when it's released. And with those two pieces of information, I can figure out if it's being held down currently. And maybe with conditionals, I'll give you a little warning. I do use some conditionals in this code, uh, very sparingly, um, but this, uh, this is why this is a lecture example and not a homework, because there's a certain case where I just have to use a conditional. Uh, it's when the apex of the jump is reached. I can't do that without a conditional. I have tried. Um, I have tried. But because of that, I can't assign this as a homework, because you need a conditional there. Uh, so left, right, jump, pressed and released, and also landing on a platform. And if you want to add walking off a platform, that could be another, uh, another method of the API. What happens when a will you walk off a method, or walk off, walk off a, uh, a platform. Yeah, we lose marbles being in, uh, in a lecture hall now. Uh, on Twitch, we used to play marbles on stream. And the states, so which states should exist in this? Uh, looking through the spec sheet and picking apart what states can I be in where the API methods are going to change. So whether I'm standing or walking, this is the first one that we hit. If we're standing or walking, we're going to have different behavior from the jump button. So that tells me I have a state transition. I have a state standing, a state walking, and the jump button is going to do different things based on which one of those two states I'm in. It's gonna have more, uh, more velocity depending on which one of those states I have. Uh, while you're in the air, 
we have a different behavior of the left and right buttons. So if you, you're moving left in the air and you hit right, you should be going slower than if you did that same thing while you're on the ground. So on the ground, walking is different than being in the air and moving because the left and right buttons, well, one of those two, depending on the direction you're currently moving, is going to have different behavior. It's a state transition. So in the air, we have different, um, different behavior. It's going to be the same, that specific feature, same whether we're jumping or rising, uh, um, jumping, rising, or falling. So both of these will be in the air states and we'll get this functionality because we have to have it more fine grained down here. When we're jumping up, we go through platforms. When we're falling down, we land on platforms. Two different sets of behavior. So we have two different states there and we hit that state transition at the apex of the jump, which is where I need a conditional. If, uh, if my vertical velocity just flipped from positive to negative, I'm falling now. I can't do that without a conditional because I, 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 there's a logical check of, uh, of the number. Uh, falling, well, we talked about that. And then finally dead, you reach the bottom of the screen, you got a game over state where everything's just disabled. And let's scan through the spec sheet one more time, this time with a focus on the state transitions. When do we transition a state? Uh, from standing to walking, when left or right is pressed, if I'm in the standing state and the player hits either left or right, I'm going to be in the walking state. When I'm in the walking state, I'm gonna to go to the standing state when either my left released or right released methods are called. Somebody released that button, we're no longer going to be in the walking state, we're going back to the standing state. If we're walking or standing, either one of these, the jump button's pressed, we're gonna move into the jump state. If we're falling and we land on a platform, we're gonna to transition to the standing state. If we're walking and we just walk off the edge of a platform, we're gonna be in the falling state. If we're jumping and hit the apex, that, that nasty thing that needs a conditional, uh, we hit the apex, we're gonna to transition to the falling state, and from any of these states, we reach the bottom of the screen, game over. End of our game. We're gonna visualize that with a state pattern. So we take all that design that we just did, aside from the, the API, it's implicitly the buttons on this slide anyway, and take all the states and the state transitions and visualize them with a state pattern. If I'm in the standing state and hit left or right, I'm walking, release them, standing, jump pressed, we're gonna be rising, apex reached, falling, land on a platform, standing, uh, and if you're holding left or right, uh, you'll go from standing immediately to walking the next frame walk off a platform falling from any of these states. You're gonna hit a game over if you hit the bottom of the screen. So this is the design process, taking a, a problem statement with a lot of functionality, a lot of behavior, and designing and getting to this point where we have a state diagram, where we know the states and the transitions between the states. And now it's a matter of going into the code, writing a class for each state writing an abstract class containing the API, all the abstract methods that all these classes have to implement, extending that through all five of these, having all five of these extend that, and then implementing the API. And at that point, we're going through each one of these classes and saying, okay, when I'm standing and jump is pressed, what happens? And that's when we have very short method definitions. Well, we're gonna transition into the rising state and we're going to set our vertical velocity to whatever our standing jumping velocity is. And by the way, the code for this part is in the examples repo, uh, but there's no physics engine attached to it, so it won't actually work, uh, but the physics engine is a homework that we use uh, very often. I might use it again next semester, uh, so I don't want to give the solutions to all that. But if you do want to do an extra homework and build the functionality, you know, be my guest. Uh, to get some of the functionality, aside from collision detection for the platforms, it's not too difficult, uh, but the collision detection, you might not want to do all that. Um, but the code for the state pattern that we're using is all in there. You can look at the states and all the state pattern stuff. So what do I need to do from state? Oh, the reason I said that. So with the physics engine, you just have to set the velocity of each 
object in the game, and then the physics engine takes over from there. So when we're in the standing state and we hit the jump button, we're gonna set our vertical velocity to whatever our standing jump uh, potential, our standing jump uh, power, I guess, uh, whatever that is, we're gonna set to that velocity and then transition to the rising state and then the physics engine takes over from there. So it's two lines of code. Uh, set the z velocity and transition, state transition into rising. If we're walking, same thing, except you use the walking jump velocity. So each one of these methods are gonna be very easy to implement at this point, once the design work is done. So let's take a look at some of that. Let's take a side trip, go into the code. And specifically, collapse this a little bit, and specifically our states. So I have a player. Player is going to have a state. I have my constants, my standing jump velocity, walking jump velocity, my walking speed, and then my air speed, which is going to be when I reverse direction mid-air. How fast uh, am I allowed to go? How fast does the player go during that? So I have my constants here, and my state. And then I'm going to defer to my state for my API. Just defer to the state, and I have a little extra code to keep track of when a button is being held down. If a being, button's being held down, I wanna know that through these variables. It's gonna be true across all the states that doesn't depend on state, so I'm gonna have the player remember, is this button currently being held down? I won't go over all the, the small details because I want to get to the, the states, but I just want to scroll through this for those of you curious. Of course, you can open the repo and see the same stuff. Uh, that's physics stuff. I don't even want to show that because it's just going to detract from what we want to talk about. All right, so what we do want to talk about is the player state. So we have a player state. It's going to take a reference to a player so it knows the player to which it's attached, which in this, we do have two players. So the state really needs to know which of the two players it's being attached to. It has a reference right here. And here's where I do have some conditionals with the help. I should, I think, could I get rid of those ones? I don't know. But uh, again, that's why it doesn't make a good homework assignment because I can't ban conditionals with this. Um, I don't even want that one anyway. Uh, so for most of these, I don't have any definition in the player state. Now, we could just do this and say these are abstract methods. I'm actually not using abstract methods here uh, as kind of a, a preference. Uh, I think it keeps the code a bit cleaner. I'm gonna have default behavior of nothing for most of these methods. So if I'm in a state that doesn't override anything, Oops, those are all redundant. Um, bad example. Like if I'm in a state that doesn't override certain methods, then those methods do nothing. So I'm gonna say the default behavior is nothing, and if I don't override it, it does nothing. So when I'm implementing a state, I'm only implementing the methods that actually do something. So that's a point of preference, feel free to do the same thing. But notice that there is a big difference between this and this. This is an abstract method that has to be overridden. Even if you override and have it do nothing, it has to be overridden. If I do default behavior of nothing, then I don't have to override it because it has a definition, the definition just does nothing. So a little, maybe a little nuanced point. Uh, it's up to your preference what you wanna do in your code. Uh, but I like having, at least in this situation, default behavior of nothing. And then I'm gonna start implementing these in the concrete classes. For this, I actually leverage polymorphism, uh, leverage inheritance, sorry. Uh, polymorphism too all over the place, but uh, inheritance for this one. And I noticed that my walking state and my standing state are going to have a lot of common functionality. They're gonna have just a little bit different 
functionality depending on uh, what's happening. Like jump press, I'm either going to use standing jump velocity or the walking jump velocity. And a little bit of a different behavior when left or right is pressed. We're going to change directions or transition to the standing state. Everything else is the same, so I'm actually going to factor out all of that common functionality into an on-ground state. So whenever we're on the ground, we're always going to have this functionality, whether we're walking or standing still. So just so I'm not repeating myself and putting these things in both classes, I'm going to factor them out and have a third class that's going to store this common functionality. And then standing and walking are going to extend on ground. And on ground is going to extend player state. Instead of standing and walking, extending player state directly. And if we're on the ground, either walking or standing, and we press, the player presses left, the player's going to walk left, which sets, uh, sets the velocity to the left for the physics engine to take over, and then transition the state to walking. So even if we're already in the walking state, we're going to transition to walking. Uh, we're going to have an extra state transition. It's not going to harm anything. We're going to be OK. Uh, we're going to have that state transition sometimes from walking to walking. Uh, it, assuming that's the player pressing left, and then on the very next frame, releasing and pressing right. Uh, it would be the only case where that would happen. Or no, holding down left and then pressing right. Uh, same thing with right, but the opposite direction. And then falling, if the player starts falling, which is when they walk off the platform, whether they're standing there and uh, the platform moves out from under them would be, could be a feature that we had. Uh, or walking off the platform, they're going to transition into the falling state. Then physics is going to control gravity, and gravity will take over from there and pull you down. So the point is, these methods are like two lines of code, one or two lines of code. When you go to actually implement the methods, you're thinking very narrowly. If I'm walking and the player presses jump, What's going to happen? Well, I'm going to set my velocity for the jump and transition to the rising state. When you write your methods, it should be very straightforward like that. This is what's going to happen. Very simple, short and sweet. Because you already designed, you already did the big thinking when you design things. When you get to the methods and writing the code, should be very simple. And we might as well keep going through the code. Uh, just like on ground, I also have an in-air state, which is abstract, extends player state, and implements any behavior that's going to be the same whether I'm rising or falling. So left or right pressed, we're going to switch directions and move at the slower speed. So even if they're holding left, release it and then push it again, we're going to set them to the slower speed. We're going to count that as a direction change. If jump is pressed, oh, we didn't talk about that one yet. And then falling and rising, the only difference between falling and rising is what happens when they collide with a platform. When falling, colliding with the platform is going to transition us to the standing state. And when rising, colliding with the platform isn't going to do anything. Uh, oh, yeah, and jump release, oops. Jump release is a big one. Uh, and jump release, how are we going to get that behavior where depending on how long the user holds down the jump button, they're going to jump higher or less. Well, I kept it pretty simple with that. When they release the jump button, I'm going to cut their velocity, their z velocity in half. Only when they're rising, not when they're falling, or else they would cushion their fall. So when they're rising, they release it, cutting their velocity. Simple, short, sweet, one line. We got a pretty complex feature that without the state pattern, you could you know, you could grind the gears a while and try to come up with something. It would probably be more than one line of code uh, to be able to get that functionality. Here, state pattern, it's like, oh, yeah, we have to have some feature where the longer the user holds the jump button, we have to uh, let them jump higher or lower. Okay, well, let me go to the rising state. That's the only state affected by that feature. Let me go to jump released because that's the action that the user's taken to let us know that they want to uh, uh, stop rising. They want to, you know, uh, not do a full big jump, and just cut their velocity by two. 
We don't want to set it, you know, we could just set it equal to zero. If you ever played a platformer, that could be frustrating. As soon as you release the button, you're just dropping like a rock. Uh, Count it by two works pretty well. And then falling, this is where we have to do the, which is actually in the player, this is where we have our, uh, I shouldn't even went to it, right here. Uh, once the velocity, once the velocity flips, once we hit the apex of that jump, I'm gonna call the state and call its falling method uh, to be able to determine if it's falling. That handles walking off a platform or hitting the apex of the jump or transition into falling. Okay, it's a lot of code. You do have this, all those states, you do have that example in the repo. Uh, so please uh, either ask questions right now, look at the repo or both. Yeah, that's the, the project call. Uh, but that code is also in the repo. Oh, but that one has the stubbed out. I think that one has extra comments, right? That you're saying with the Java docs. That Alex is saying. Yeah, there's a link in the lecture chat to, to the repo for my handout code for the physics engine homework. So if you do want to check out the physics engine homework, add a little functionality, get those dots moving around the screen. That's there for you. Dividing velocity by zero would or by two would never reach zero, would it? No, th not on that line. Because since we're rising, velocity is always positive in the z direction, where I have positive z being up. The, if the z velocity is positive and I divide it by two, it's never gonna reach zero. But when the physics engine takes over with gravity, gravity's constantly decreasing your z velocity unless you're standing on a platform. Uh, so uh, gravity's gonna bring it down to zero, down to sub-zero, yeah. It stays consistent. Oops, wrong buttons. So I can keep changing directions. Once I change direction once, I'm gonna be moving at the slower speed, but then it's always that slower speed. It doesn't keep cutting it down. If I, the only way to, I wonder if I can find some bugs in this. Maybe not. Um, because that divided by two is when I release the button. So like here, I'm just holding up, holding jump, press and hold jump. Once I release it early, here I'm releasing it early, that's when the velocity is cut by two. So it doesn't kill my jump as soon as I release it. I'm just cutting that velocity. So that's the only time we're doing like a divide by two. Uh, we're not doing the same divide by two when we're changing directions midair. We have a hard-coded uh, airspeed, so I'm always getting a, an X velocity of 2.5 whenever I change directions. I'm just setting it to that constant. If I ever retire the physics engine homework, I'll update this example to, you know, give you all the physics and everything too, and you can play the game without doing extra work or I'll just start assigning it again. Once I, so it's fun, so I give that as the GUI when, uh, when you work on the physics engine homework, whenever I do assign that. Uh, and uh, as you do the homework, you get more features in the game. You can start having the players move around. Okay, so no, no questions on any of that? Or are the questions, what the hell is going on? Yes. So when you, I think it's when you um, on ground dot scale up like file. Mm -hmm. Do you migrate override uh, all like do you set the player state to new call? Like is there a need for the new to word there? Like for instance over one you just say like player dot state equal to new. Mm -hmm. So each state is a class and then to transition to a different state, I need to create a new object of that type, of that class type. So when we're, 
So when we create, when we do the state transition, every time we transition, we're actually creating a new object of that type. So I'm creating a new object of type falling, which I'm really interested in the behavior of that object. I'm gonna create a new object of type falling, pass it a reference to the player so it knows what it's attached to, and then set the state. We could redesign this to have singletons for each one of the states. Um, actually, we can't. No, I, I mean, I like it better this way. You could potentially have singletons of each state. Uh, I don't like, do I even wanna go down this road? Uh, so you could create all the states once and then store them so that you don't have to recreate them every time because we are, you know, we're inefficient in our memory, in our heap space management right here. You can do that. Um, but there, it's, you can get jammed up when you do that in a way where you can only have one of each state, and then what happens when we want two players? What happens when we want to add a third player? It's easy to get jammed up in cases like that. You could, when you create a new player, you could have the player create all of its states, uh, and that would get around all the problems uh, for a little bit of memory efficiency. In 116, we don't care too much about memory efficiency. In 220, that's something you'll think more about, about how to manage your memory and not be so wasteful like we are here. If that's what your question was. Okay. Oops. Okay, anything else? I have questions here, because I know y'all didn't completely understand all of this. It's a lot, it's a lot. Does the previous class get to deleted from memory? It better? Yeah, it does. So uh, I didn't talk about this when we talked about heap space. It's not really part of this class. Uh, 220, you'll talk about this more, and you actually have to code it yourselves. Uh, is uh, whenever an object on the heap no longer has any way of being reached, so whenever all of the references to that object are no longer in scope and no longer on the stack, or indirectly, like an object on the stack has a reference to an object that has a reference to this object. Once all those connections are gone and you have no way of accessing an object on the heap anymore, oh, heap, I said the wrong thing. Uh, has, uh, once you no longer have access to an object on the heap anymore, it gets garbage collected. So Scala, uh, the JVM, is going to look through all of your objects on the heap, and if you no longer have any way of accessing them, it's gonna free it up and destroy that, get rid of that memory. So that's something we can really meaningfully talk about in, uh, um, with a language that has garbage collection, because the language just does everything for us. It does everything for us. So we don't really have to think about it, and it's hard to force you to think about it. I can't just say, uh, here's a homework where garbage collection is banned. You can't just turn it off. Uh, but in 220, you're gonna use C, which does not have garbage collection, and you have to manage all of your own memory. That's where you're really gonna dig deep into stack and heap and really think about how memory is, is handled. We just give you a, a cursory level understanding of it in 116. 220, you're gonna dive into that and talk about memory being freed, memory management, uh, malloc, uh, allocating your own memory, asking the OS for your own memory, uh, stuff like that, which is what malloc is. Yes? 220 will be in C. Yeah, so you have to learn C for 220. Uh, 250, as far as I know, will continue to be in Scala. So next semester you have 250 in Scala for data structures, and then 220 in C for systems programming. So if you want to get ahead in 220 right now, start studying C. C is like, oh, how do I summarize C? C is kind of like the lack of a language. It's just very basic functionality. Uh, like your module one and two stuff from 115, like that's all you have. There are no classes. Um, no, like, the, the standard library has almost nothing in it. It doesn't even have strings. It's good stuff. Uh, you'll really learn about the low-level details, which is why we like it for that cl class. Class is all about low-level details. C is like the second letter in Scott. Thanks for that, Nicholas. <laughs> all right, all right, let's get to this big diagram on the next page. So we talked about this, we showed it in the code. Uh, now let's uh, talk about our state, our inheritance tree for all of these states. We have our abstract state, which defines just the API. This is all of the methods that we're going to defer to the state for functionality, things that the player class itself is not going to handle. 
Uh, everything's defined in the state as an abstract class. And then we're going to extend that for each state that we have. We have five different states, falling, rising, walking, standing, game over. And then we notice that two pairs of these states have a lot in common. So we took what we know about inheritance and factored out the common functionality into another abstract class. So we have these abstract classes on ground for all my on ground behavior, in air for all my in air behavior, have those extend state and implement anything that's going to be true, any behavior that's going to take place when I'm either on the ground or in the air. And then I implemented those twice for each of my concrete states and finished the functionality, implemented all the rest of the behavior that I want for those states. Now for your homework, you don't need these intermediate classes. I wanted to show you another example of where we can use inheritance to, uh, to clean up our code a bit, to uh, most importantly in this case, remove duplicate code. So I'm not writing the same code and cut and pasting it in a whole bunch of classes. All right, so we built the jumper class, but I advertise that this is good for, uh, the state pattern is good for extending functionality. So what if we have a task to add a double jump to this game? We have our existing state pattern in all our states, and we wanna add a double jump. Without the state pattern, this would probably be pretty tough to do. With the state pattern, no problem. We're gonna add a little bit of functionality. We're gonna to go to our existing rising and falling states, implement the jump pressed method to jump again. We're gonna set the Z velocity to a jump. We're gonna add two new states because we can't have, uh, if we wanna avoid conditionals, we have minimal conditionals in this code. We're gonna add two more states because our behavior is going to change after we use the double jump because we can't use it twice. So we're gonna have two new states. We're the rising after we use the double jump and falling after we use the double jump. And they're identical to rising and falling except the jump button doesn't do anything. So for these classes, we'll actually extend rising and falling and just override the jump button, jump press functionality to do nothing. Then we're gonna update our state transitions and we're gonna see, uh, 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 we're gonna update our state diagram to just have that rising after double jump when the jump is pressed, go to falling and then back to standing and yes, we could do this with a Boolean flag. If the double jump has been pressed, uh, don't allow it to be pressed again. Use that flag, use a Boolean flag to do that. We could do that, but what if you can't use conditionals? You'd use an extra state. So if you have something that only works once, like hitting the checkout button should only work once. Hitting cash or credit should only work once when you're in the checkout state. If you have something that should only work once, you better be thinking state transition going to be a state transition and then, uh, and then that new state is going to take over the new behavior. It's going to define the new behavior. Then our inheritance tree looks like this now. Right, uh, I'm out of time. Just real quick, the state pattern isn't the be all end all. Uh, now that you know the state pattern after you get through homework too, you got to think of when this is applicable and when, it's, uh, when you should apply it. And uh, really we used it for practice with inheritance and polymorphism, but when you're out there after this homework, think about when this applies and when it should and shouldn't be used. Uh, that's where we want you to be at. All right, see you Monday, see you Wednesday.